Good morning. I'm standing outside church, obviously, today, and I'm standing outside church to record the final sermon in the Being Church Together series. I need to be honest right now, I feel quite nervous. I've, I'm standing outside for a specific reason. I want to step out in faith this morning as we come to look at Paul's final words in his first letter to the Corinthians. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on verses 13 and 14 of this final section. And as you can see, I'm live recording. I'm not going to edit this. I'm not going to prepare anyone. Why I'm nervous is I'm going to try and talk to members of the public in the sermon. Now, I want to see if I can get someone walking through the church property and I want to ask them a couple of questions. Now, it might fail. It might totally fail. They might get rude. But even if they are, there's a good opportunity to try to be kind, to try to be courteous and to recognise that Jesus told us to go and speak to people about his kingdom. He didn't tell us it would be easy. He didn't tell us that um, speaking for him would be without cost. In fact, he said the opposite. But I'm hoping in faith that I can get a few people to speak to me and it will help us to consider what Paul says. Well, look, in this final passage of 1 Corinthians from verse 13 through to the end of the chapter, Paul speaks about a number of very specific things. He talks about some of the good servants in the church, excellent servants like Stephanus. He um, says a lot, but in his final exhortation to the Corinthians, in being church together, he gives them a final charge and this can be found in verses 13 and verses 14. And he says this, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. Now these final five commands stand together, but they actually stack, they build up on top of each other like a pyramid and it starts on that base of be your guard and then it builds into standing firm, be, in, be on your guard, then builds into standing firm in your faith. Then they're commanded by Paul to be courageous and on top of that be strong. And finally the pinnacle is to build everything in love. Now here comes an ambulance um, do an amazing job in our community. I'll just pause. There you go. So these commands he says to this community live together in this way. And look, it starts with being on your guard. Being on your guard is a specific expression. In fact, the Bible in over 130 places talks about this. It talks about the connection to this because they're not talking about guarding the gates, but it's talking about guarding your heart, guarding your heart before God. See, 130 times at least, the scripture talks about how precious our heart life with God is. One of those best known ones Solomon wrote in Psalms 4, Psalm, sorry, Proverbs 4, he said, guard your heart because it is the wellspring of your life. See, your heart, when it's open to the Father, when you're alive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, when your heart is full of worship for Jesus, that's where your heart shows true Christianity, shows a true expression of your faith. If you ask that question, do I have authentic faith? Well, the answer is, does it come from your heart? Does your heart show your faith? Because our hearts actually do speak about the real us, you know, and many of us have words, we have front, we tell the same jokes over and over, we have facades, we have bravado, we have masks. We often hide who we truly are. I've uh, been reading this week about a man who killed himself and the bravado and the faces and the, the masks that he put on and how he felt he wasn't ever able to be honest about who he was. So we have these heart, these masks that often cover up our hearts, but the Bible tells us that the heart is what's most important and it's the spring of life from which we show the world who we are. And you know, if we're a Christian, our hearts should flow forth with a Christ-like way of treating others, a way of speaking about everyone. It's easy to speak about the people we like. Um, it's hard to speak and show love to the people we don't know. Here's a man, let me ask him a question. Excuse me, sir, I'm doing a bit of research. I'm, I'm just telling you I'm filming. Do you walk through this church quite often? I do, yeah. You do? Do you know anything about this church? Not really. Not really? I just, just so I can see you're a real man. Thank you, sir, have a lovely day. So you don't really know anything about this church, that's very helpful. There you go. My heart's beating, that was hard work. 
not because it lasted long, but because you're nervous about speaking to people when you don't know them. It was very kind of him, and he wasn't rude in any way. So he walks through our grounds all the time, regularly, doesn't really know anything about our church. We'll come back, back to that later. So after, after this, we're told about guarding, guarding, be on your guard, guard your heart. We're then told to stand firm in our faith. Now we can grasp the meaning of this, perhaps in terms of buckling up, putting our back into our faith, gritting our teeth and recognizing that a lot of life is a tough battle. And in this tough battle, we, we need to try to be solid and to walk unshakably. But how do we do that? What enables us to stand firm? Well, Paul's been speaking to the Corinthians about it the whole way through. And Paul's been speaking to us, if we're listening, the whole way through. Standing firm in the faith is about being together, about being knit into his body, into the church, being immersed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. He's come and gone, he's retired now, but I was thinking about Usain Bolt. I was thinking about that moment where he breaks the world record and it just goes inconceivably fast. It seems almost impossible. And we watch that brilliance and we see his swagger and we enjoy the pleasure of someone at their best. What makes him so? Well, as much as some people might just say it's genetics, it's actually not. Yes, of course he has good genes. But what's made him that best runner that we've ever seen to date was practice. Thousands and thousands of hours of practice. It's a matter of the fact that he stood firm in his belief that he would do everything he could to cross that line to be the best. He had the right mindset, open and willing to learn. He had the right attitude, ready to strive and try and be the best. He wanted to do everything. Well, how do we stand firm in the faith if we don't see ourselves as people willing to have that same mindset for Christ. See, the scriptures, the spirit, the community of faith, these are all things that are given to us by God to wrap us together on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Now, there's some more people coming. Excuse me, could I ask you a question? I'm just filming a simple question there. Do you walk through here quite often? Yeah. yeah. Do you know, stop recording? Um, you don't? No, we went to a Catholic church up the road. Okay. So, it's not a, yeah. a bad question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't believe I just pressed stop on my record. It's a nightmare. I'm going to have to fix that later. Okay, so you come through here quite, quite often, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you don't know much about the church or no, perhaps anything. Church, okay. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Right. I'm going to have to try and splice these video clips together. So that was a young couple walking through, come through again all of the time. Don't know anything about the church. It's good for us to know these things. So as I said a moment ago, the Holy Spirit, the scriptures, the community of faith, these are the things that wrap us together on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, who is the one that enables us to stand firm for him, helps us to stand firm, not by giving us willpower, but by expressing forgiveness to us. He's the one who forgives our sins and he gives us secure hope in the present and he gives us the promise of an everlasting future. But to stand firm in that faith for him, we have to embrace him and his community, his word, his spirit on a daily basis. Right, the next th thing, well, there's another lady coming. Let me just see if I can get her to ask you a question. Excuse me, do you walk through here every day? No, you don't walk through here every day. Thank you, have a lovely time. Wasn't gonna do anything nasty. She was scared, that's okay. It's a bit intimidating when a stranger asks you a question. Um, the third foundation about being courageous. Paul says to them, be courageous. Now, the expected answer for courage, we might think, perhaps all courage and strength, is, is we might think of someone like Joshua, who's called to stand before the unknown of the promised land, who's called to lead the children of Israel into a place they didn't know. Or perhaps it's a call, we think, to be someone like David, who faces down a nine foot tall Goliath, who takes a sling and five, smooth stones and goes to slay a giant. Now I'm happy with those examples, but I want us to expand our minds a little and consider the day-to-day -day normality of life because often when we think of such extremities like that of life, we think God will be with us in these difficult moments if we have to face a giant. But actually, 
We need God to help us be courageous in the normality of life. You know, if you get to lead a nation into foreign lands or you have the opportunity to decapitate the world's tallest man um, for God. Anyway, um, that might still apply, but let's think about courage in our day-to-day -day lives. See, spiritual courage isn't only for those edge of the universe Goliath moments. In fact, I'd argue we need spiritual courage to be who we are for Jesus in our day-to-day -day walk. And we need it a lot more than we do for those extreme moments because we spend nearly all of our time in the normality of life. Spiritual courage, the courage um, that we get from God is courage that requires us to do something challenging. It requires us to mature in our faith. And maturity, as we should know, isn't something we get by days on the earth. Spiritual maturity comes out in obedience, in living out our faith in community. Well, look, spiritual courage, it requires us to be present for God, it requires us to be present for God in the choices of our life. Now, that might sound strange because you say, well, I am present in my life. But, you know, when you face those moments when your lips are there and they want to speak words, difficult words, when your lips want to slag people off or gossip about them, or when your mind wants to be angry with people because they don't do what you want to do or they're different from you. When you are challenged in your attitudes with subtle racisms and sexisms and gender issues, will we have the courage to love people like Jesus did? Will we have the courage to stand up in our own lives as a witness to truth in our own walk? Will we stop ourselves? Will we correct ourselves according to the word of God and to the commands of Christ? Because, you know, it's, the Bible tells us that Jesus had every struggle that we have. Everything we face, he faced, yet he was without sin. Well, think about that. You might think people affront you. You might think even people inside God's um, community affront you. And that gives you the right to behave in ways you shouldn't. Jesus experienced all of that and more. His best friends betrayed him. The people he came to help chose to rescue a criminal and had him nailed to a cross. Not one word, not one thought of evil came from him. That took courage that you and I need. You know, when we want to satisfy sin's pleasures, will we be courageous and stop ourselves with prayer? and with the testimony of the word. It's what Jesus did when he started, isn't it? It's why the devil tempted him three times to see if he had the courage to live for God. You know, because if we can't be courageous and stand up to ourselves, then we'll rarely have the courage to live courageously for anyone else, let alone stand up for them or stand up to them. Let's not kid ourselves. If we haven't got discipline in our own lives, how are we gonna ever say to others, Actually, this is the way God wants you to live. You know, being courageous means standing up to your ego as well. How big is your ego? How big is it today? How much air do you pump into it and fill up for the sake of yourself? Being courageous means surrendering to Jesus, not your own pomposity. Being courageous is a discipline of the Holy Spirit and in it, God sees your humility. God sees you stepping back from arrogance from self-righteousness and God blesses you as you're courageous in your day to day. You know what, I think there's years of change just in that one alone. The question is, is do we have the courage to trust God to change us in it? The fourth layer is about being strong. Being strong in recognizing the layers of these commands. I wanna link strength and love because you know, strength without love is tyranny, it's stoicism, it's simply judgment. We speak of people who aren't good enough according to our standards. We're strong about what we believe, but we're not strong to love people in our beliefs, draw them in. But then love without strength, this easily deteriorates too into sentimentality or silly liberalisms. Liberalisms that are often without biblical foundations. So we have to be strong in the Lord, trusting in Jesus, to turn the other cheek, to walk for him in those challenging moments. And the final command, the, the top of this pinnacle from Paul is, do everything in love. This command simply um, isn't about our actions, but doing everything in love encompasses our thoughts too. 
We're called to love everyone, and I mean everyone. So this is top tier living for Jesus right here, and it's a, it's a massive struggle for us, a, an incredible challenge to do everything in love. We want to see some people get what they deserve, some people who affront us, who live certain ways. We want to judge people ourselves based on their identity, their faith, their sexuality, and yet do everything in love, Jesus said. Now look, there's one more person that's coming through. Excuse me, sir, could I ask you a question? Do you walk through here all the time? Um, well, quite often. Yeah. Do you know anything about the church? Yeah. What do you know? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just recording something here. Um, anything, do you know anything useful? I'm just doing some research. Yes. Um, what do you know about the church? The church in general? This one. Sort of one. Um, I know about it's coffee morning. Okay. Sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you come to the coffee morning sometimes? No. You should do, it's good. I mean, yeah. I don't run it, but it's good. No, no, I, mean, um, yeah, I, know, I know people yeah, yeah, yeah. that come here. And you know people it. that come. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Right. You have a lovely day. Thank you. Thanks. Copper and Company. Copper and Company on Wednesday, doing good things. Where's the other Copper and Companies? Where's the one on a Tuesday or a Monday? Simon's doing such a fabulous work. Where's the other Simons? You know what, we talked about training some people to run Copper and Company. If you want training so you can do what Simon does where he puts the kettle on and it's hospitable to people, then come forward, let's get you trained so that more people can kind of testify that that man did. Look, we're concluding this sermon, concluding this whole book, and I'm gonna get a bit of help from an Anglican. Um, so I'm not converting um, like Anglicans, but um, it's an Anglican preacher from a long ago called Herman, and there's, you can tell it's from long ago because we don't know that many Hermans. Herman Melville. Herman Melville said this, ye live not for yourselves. Ye cannot live for yourselves because a thousand fibers connect you with your fellow man. And along those fibers, as sympathetic threads, run your actions as causes and return to you as effects. Hope I haven't melted your brain. A thousand fibers connect you with your fellow men. Now he wrote that in 1855 and Melville understood how well God has weaved his people into his world and how God has placed us alongside a world of not yet Christians. So we're connected to people what Melville calls through sympathetic threads. We're connected to those who don't yet know God. And I'd argue that what he's expressing is a work of the Holy Spirit connecting us, letting us share the life that God gives us. And that means what we share, what we show is received and the response of that ripples back to us. Now that mechanism is part of how God shares his love with the world through you, through me. The hardest part of this the hardest part is perhaps not what you might think. You might think the hardest part is finding those connections. Some of us perhaps don't know many people outside the church and that does need to change. We need to be connected out into the world. But the hardest part is not live, finding those connections and living out our faith day by day. It's not sculpting those connections because that's what God has done. And if we trust God, God will do that. The hardest part in those connections is being surrendered to God. See, when we surrender to God, we share in the promise from Isaiah 41 verse 10, where God says this, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Brothers and sisters, we need to surrender ourselves to God each day. We need to build on what the apostle Paul has shown us in this series on being church together. We've just seen, hopefully I can weave these two, I've got to be able to weave these two um, videos together. We've seen just a few people. It would be possible to suggest that on a daily basis, a hundred or more people walk through the place where God has put us as a display of his splendor. And the truth is, most of them know nothing about us and that isn't about having a good notice board because it, Melville's point isn't your notice boards are connected to people 
notice boards have use. They're kind of like 2% of the use. But the real need is for us, us to connect to people. And it isn't easy. As I say, I was scared to come out here and do this. Not in case someone swore at me. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time. It's not the last time. Um, not even worried about that. But it's a big thing to talk to people. It's a lot easier when we get to know them. It's a lot easier when we've had a chance to show them that, that they can trust us, that we love them, that we're genuinely bothered about them. Not just so we can say Jesus loves you, but so they know that we love them and that we really mean what we say because our world has got so many lonely people in it. Our world has never been more broken and isolated and disconnected. People have Teslas and technology and all of these things. But people are lonely. They need friends, they need God's people. They don't need to worry about how those connections are made, but we do, as I said at the end there. We need to surrender. Surrender ourselves to the living God. Because we can't do all this in our strength, but we will do it in his strength, the mighty strength of God. So as this series comes to a conclusion, let's ask God, how do we connect to our world? How do we surrender to you? What do we need to do for you to be significant in our community, with our neighbours, to these people? What do we do? need to do, God, so that when people walk through this area, they go, that's Morden Park Baptist Church. I know those people. These are the ways they love us. These are the way they've helped me. These are the ways they're doing stuff positive for our community. God bless you. Thank you, James, for leading. Thank you um, for bringing that worship into this time. And I just pray God's blessing on us as we trust and work out our faith in him. Amen.